going to be talking about um, Amarsha Sen's uh, two books of his, condensed into 55 minutes. Um, those are his book, um, The Idea of Justice, um, and uh, Development is Freedom. The second book in particular is, is quite popular in the development, development community. Okay. Um, I know it's, it's a lot to put into one lecture, but uh, all the gory details are in my book, so you can go look at that when you're doing the homework. Okay. Um, so that's what we're up to today. I want to start by talking about um, Professor Sen. Um, so he's an economist and a philosopher both. He is a professor at Harvard. Um, <coughs> he won the Nobel Prize in Economic Systems a number of years back. He's a native of India. Started out as a professor there, went as a professor in England, ended up as a professor at Harvard. Um, the two books I'm going to be covering are, as I just said, and then he's got other books too. Um, the, one of the key ideas here will be his so-called capabilities approach. And that, that is one of the very popular ideas in the development community. Okay, So, so uh, we'll be talking about that um, in uh, some detail. Okay. So he's sort of, um, in his uh, book, The Idea of Justice, he kind of launches from Rawls' perspective. Of course, he worked with Rawls. Rawls was another professor at Harvard. I mean, they knew each other very well, OK? And he says, well, Rawls generated what you would call an ideal just system we talked about last time, a political conception of justice in the so-called realistically utopian society, OK? What would be best? Um, if it were even possible. Sen takes a different approach, philosophically quite different. He doesn't take such an approach as saying what is ideally just. He just simply develops a, what he calls a comparative justice theory. So the idea here, is, and he claims this is a better approach, is, is that you, you um, set up a system so that you can say how things should change in order to improve justice. Whereas in Rawls' system, it's not clear how to get to the ideal. Sen's trying to say, my system of justice is such that I'm gonna, it's going to be clearer how to tweak things so you move the system in the right direction towards a more just system or away from being a less just system or an unjust system. Um, first thing he covers is the role of public reasoning. Um, so public reasoning is, it should be thought of as like group discussion. Okay. Um, you can think of it in some sense like democracy. It's a group discussion and decision about things together. So he says this helps with comparative assessment of how to promote justice. Justness. In particular, you might look at different proposals on how to make the system just, and the, there's public reasoning about how to make it more just, and everybody comes to agreement, yes, this is the best way to make it just, maybe via voting, and that change is then implemented. Um, he says that the public reasoning can identify features of what's actually happening. So in public reasoning, he's thinking of public reasoning in a very broad sense. He's not just talking about public reasoning in the sense of this class, we talk, we reason together, come to some conclusions. He's thinking broadly across society and including the media that might expose you know, problems, etc., and identify what is happening in the sense of what is just or what is unjust. unjust. It may provide an incomplete assessment, but it may provide guidance on achieving social um, justice. Okay? Um, of course, it's, it's very difficult to hear through the noise, right? Just, list, just look at the media, and there's so much disagreement by the experts, let alone just common people like us over, over issues, that it's, it's really quite difficult to know what to do in order to make things fair. Um, the other thing about public reasoning is, is he, he is not only thinking of public reasoning in terms of a society, he's thinking about the influences from other societies. He's thinking of global public reasoning in a sense. But he will accept that you might have some group like a country that has sort of public reasoning about what's fair in that society. But what he says is, is that there ought to be like, you ought to listen to external voice, voices coming into your country and saying, that's not fair. You guys are all wrong. That's not fair. Okay, and he, he refers to this, um, you know, as the open or closed impartiality. Um, the idea is, is that if you have someone that is just impartial from another country, come into your country and say, you know, 
are you guys, you, uh, is this right? Is this fair? Well, we ought to really listen to those kind, of, those, those that kind of voice. Of course, this type of voice is rising in the world because of telecommunications, right? I mean, we are we are very much now in the past, whatever, since the rise of the internet, influencing the way each other's think and their views, etc. Okay. Next, how do we judge injustices? Well, he says that there's a positional perspective. So from one position, things might look fine. From another, not so much. So for instance, you can be stuck in a society where in your society, it's sort of in the culture that it's OK to discriminate against, uh, discriminate against a certain group, and everything's fine and dandy. From your position, everything seems fine. But if you step back from another position, it's not so fine. Or if you're a different person within a country, you might say everything's fine because you're on the, the group that's generally discriminating against another group. And that group that's being discriminated against, of course, in their position, they're saying things aren't fine. Okay, So your position matters very much from your view about what's fair and um, what's not fair. Um, and that, that example, this uh, protest-free tolerance of the asymmetries and discriminations that exist, you know, this is all over the world. Um, next, he moves towards how do we measure human advancement? Do we measure it with G GNP, gross national product, GDP, or GNI, all of those things? Um, uh, uh, some kind of individual income level? And he, he says no, okay. Um, what about the quality of life, well-being, and freedoms? So Marcia Sen, if you, you probably remember, Marcia Sen and uh, it was Sen and Huck that invented the HDI, the Human Development Index, okay? And uh, that's very, well, widely used. And it includes, you recall, income, um, education, and health as measured by life expectancy, okay? Um, so he's going to expand some of those views uh, uh, here and, and take even more things into account. Um, so he says in, income and wealth are not important by themselves, but for only what they help us achieve, including good and worthwhile lives, as defined by us, not as defined by someone else. So <clears throat> a lot of people would consider living a good long life to be a freedom. Um, uh, but it's, uh, you guys watch this video, I forget, was it Wilkinson, Inequality in Society? Or have you watched that yet? I forget. I'm going to sign it if I haven't. Okay, it's, it's assigned now, I think. Uh, so this, this, this TED Talk is, is fantastic because it gets at this concept of sense. And that is, it, if you take the, the lower socioeconomic class in the United States, for instance, and you look at their well-being as measured by health, for instance, and so forth, and, uh, and their income level, um, turns out they might have, compared to another it's a, a country in the developing world, they might have a much higher income le well, level, but a much poorer <coughs> health. So this is confusing. And what Wilkinson explains in the TED Talk is, is it's about the inequality. This is a very tricky idea. It is not about absolute poverty. It's about the inequality in the society, too, that causes bad things for people. You know, when you're really poor, you don't have enough money for education or health, and you're generally in pretty bad shape. But the, his point is, is that it's even worse in a society where there's a, bunch, there's a few rich and a lot of poor, okay, than if everyone were at that level. It's a pretty amazing idea. Okay, that's pretty well studied now too. It's people take it as fact. <coughs> Next, freedom. So freedom gives us more opportunity to pursue objectives. That is what we value. And he calls this the opportunity aspect of freedom. In other words, I have free opportunities, free freedom of opportunity. Okay, and he, he discusses in detail the importance of that. And then he also talks about the process of choice that we all make in our life on many different things. And he says, Freedom is an important part of that, that I have freedom to make choices. If I choose to vote, I'm allowed, I, I can vote, okay? I have freedom to make that choice. And a lot of people don't have that kind of freedom, okay? So, so there's, there's two aspects of freedom he talks about. Um, next, in the capability approach, what he's trying to try to use this is to, is use this to assess justice and injustice, okay? And he starts with what information should be used to decide what to consider 
are justices injustice and what information is to be ignored. So it's kind of abstract, but he gives some really good examples, and these are the examples. So there's an old idea in economics called utilitarianism. Okay? So the information that's used in utilitarianism is, is only individual happiness or pleasure, okay, and that assesses how much advantage a person has, um, and you compare it to the advantage of others. So the idea of utilitarianism is generally um, when studying ethics comes out as the most good for the most people. But good is like a, a single numeric measure of something like he identifies like happiness or pleasure, okay? So the question is, is, you know, what's ignored here? And his claim is, and I think it's true, is, is that things are multidimensional and other things matter. I don't know, uh, you, you, some poor people that you meet that are really poor are very happy, <laughs> okay? I mean, I, you know, you, you look, you're like, well, this person doesn't need a thing. I mean, they got it all, you know? Um, so happiness um, matters independent of money, but we all know that money makes life a lot easier in some ways. In other ways, it makes it more complex, okay? So he says this is just using one thing, one measure isn't enough. Next one is libertarianism uses more information. Basically what libertarianism is all about rights, property rights, okay, for instance, and liberties such as unre unrestrained capitalism. That's why a libertarian would, uh, uh, many libertarians would oppose a minimum wage absolutely entirely, okay, in principle, <laughs> because it is a constraint on capitalism. Right? That's what, it, that's what minimum wage is. It's a constraint on capitalism. Um, now, um, now, you know, some people, you know, subscribe to the libertarian approach, and that's fine, but, um, you know, in, in uh, Sen's uh, view is, he, he says, well, if you only focus on those things, then what's the long-term consequences? That's what Sen wants to discuss. And he says long-term consequences could, in, in, I'm quoting, include rather terrible results. Um, and, and if you think about it, the United States does not have unfettered capitalism, okay? Just think back to the antitrust laws. It threw, it threw a, you know, it, it chopped off the, the, big, the, the big people, okay? I mean, in a sense. And it's, those laws are still being used, okay? So, so uh, and I think it was good that that did happen. But what's ignored in libertarianism is inequality. I mean, it, it, as, a, as a philosophy, it, 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 it ignores that. It doesn't, it doesn't you know, subscribe to John Rawls' difference principle. It would have a, a deep problem with that, okay? Um, now, that's not to say that every libertarian doesn't care about others. That's, that's not what I'm saying. I, 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 a good old friend who, who was a very strong libertarian, but you know, was very much into volunteer work and helping others, too. It, it was more of a principle um, of, of what the system should require, okay? Um, so uh, next, economics views of um, human development and uh, poverty would generally measure um, those by income, wealth, or resources. Now, of course, uh, so if I, I just measure how much income you have, it's really not a very good measure of how well you're doing necessarily because let's say if you're disabled in some way mentally or physically, you need more money for health care or a wheelchair or this or that. Um, so some people need inherently more money than, than, uh, than others. And also, um, if you only measure income, then you're throwing out the importance of, of the mind in very many ways because you're not talking, you don't measure in education, okay? Um, and of course, you don't measure health. So a lot, if you remember from earlier in class, uh, there's been a big movement away from just measuring poverty by income. And I still, when I talk to people still, whenever you say poor, the, the person you're talking to, 90% of the time, is thinking money, period, nothing else. Uh, and when that's not really the way we should be thinking at all. At least go with HDI and get, get income, health, and education involved. Um, so what does Sen say? He says we should use the capability approach. 
So he wants to assess individual advantage by a person's capability to do things he or she has reason to value. Okay, so do I have the capability to get an education or not? Well, there's no school around and I don't have the money, so I don't have really freedom or capability to do what I want. And then he has an assessment focus on the freedom an individual actually has given their capabilities. So in other words, are they also not um, oppressed by a system, for instance, um, and even though they might have a capability to do something, they're not allowed to do something. Let's say a girl not being able to go to school because of the, the culture or religion, um, or, or a woman not being able to take a certain type of job because of the culture and, and issues like that. Okay. Um, so the question is, is what kind of capabilities are important? What do we mean by capabilities? So um, I found this paper by Martha Nussbaum. She's a professor. Um, and uh, Jonathan Glover is a professor over in uh, uh, England. Um, what they said is, is they, they, they sought to come up with a list of all the capabilities that you need to have in order to live a good life. Okay? Um, and, and they say, if you don't have one of these, you're going to fail to have a good life. Now, when I read this list, I might have, you know, some disagreements. But what I did is I did the... Um, it's slightly unpleasant thing of dumping it quoted exactly right into my slides. Not gonna read, I'm not going to read every word, but I want you to be able to see it um, to see what these people are, are saying about um, the capability. So they're building on Sen's framework. Okay, They're reading his papers, his books, and they're saying, well, Marsha, you never defined what you meant by capabilities. You know, he would give like, Sen has a style of giving like an example, one example. When, of course, there's many capabilities. And these people said, no, we need to define this. And they do it. First thing, being able to live to the end of a human life of normal length, not dying prematurely or before one's life is so reduced as to not be, not, be not worth living. Okay, pretty clear. Being able to have good health, to be adequately nourished, to have adequate shelter, having opportunities for sexual satisfaction, for choice in matters of reproduction, being able to move from place to place. Okay. Now, of course, this is kept kind of abstract because these are these are some of these are difficult issues. For instance, the last line: being able to move from place to place. Of course, most of the world doesn't allow that from country to country, right? I mean, we we draw the boundaries. Now, sometimes within a country, you can't even move from place to place. Um, being able to avoid unnecessary and non-beneficial pain so far as possible and to have pleasurable experiences. Okay, that can cost money, of course. Um, being able to use the senses, being able to imagine, think, and reason to do these things in a way informed and cultivated by an adequate education, including but by no means limited to literacy and basic mathematical and scientific training. STEM education, right? That's what that last line says. Sorry, I had to say that. Um, being able to use imagination and thought, connection with experiencing and producing spiritually enriching materials and events of one's own choice, religious, literary, musical, so forth. <laughs> Believe that the production of this capability requires not only the provision of education, but also legal guarantees of freedom of expression uh, with, with respect to both political and artistic speech and freedom of religious exercise. Being able to have attachments to things and persons outside herself, to love, those who love and care for us, to grieve at their absence, in general love and grief, to experience longing and gratitude. Supporting this capability means supporting forms of human association that can be shown to be crucial in their development. Being able to form a conception of good, and that remember the conception of good was coming from John Rawls, that same idea. And to engage in critical reflection about the planning of one's own life. This includes today being able to seek employment outside the home and to participate and political life. So there's a women's rights issue um, there that's quite important, important around the world, in particular in the developing world. Um, to live for and being able to live for and to others, to recognize and show concern for others, to engage in forms of social interaction, to be able to imagine a situation with another, have compassion for that situation, to, to have capability for justice and friendship. Protecting capability means, again, protecting institutions that constitute such forms of affiliation, also protecting the freedoms of assembly and political speech. Being able to live with concern for and in relation to animals, plants, the world of nature. 
being able to laugh, to play, to enjoy recreational activities. Now, that may seem like a funny one, but we're going to come back to this issue right here. You, you remember in the UN Declaration on Human Rights, there's, there's other things like this in there about, you know, you have a right to have fun. I think it's really cool, actually. Uh, the Catholic thing said a right to rest. So, so this is seeping through the social justice things. And guess what? It's going to come to relevant to humanitarian engineering. And you might say, why? Okay? I'm not going to tell you why. We'll tell you later. All right. Being able to live one's own life and nobody else's. This means having guarantees of non-interference. Certain choices that are especially personal and, and definitive selfhood such as choices regarding marriage, childbearing, sexual expression, speech, and employment. Well, that's a loaded sentence there at the end, right? I mean, there's all kinds of issues that they're, they're raising um, with respect to um, rights and capabilities. They're saying it different. They're saying we should have the capability to do these things, okay? Being able to live one's own life in one's own surrounding context guarantees freedom of association, freedom from unwarranted search and seizure, seizure, seizure. Uh, and also means a certain sort of guarantee of the integrity of personal property, though this guarantee may be limited in various ways by the demands of social equality. So this is interesting. They're kind of going a little bit beyond Sen here. And this is more like Rawls saying this, okay? You can have your property, but if there's too much social inequality, you're supposed to do something about that. It's always up for negotiation and connection to the interpretation of other, the other <coughs> capabilities, since personal property, unlike personal liberty, is a tool of human functioning rather than an end of itself. Okay, so there's, a, there's what they say is capabilities. I'm going to come back to this list in a condensed form when we talk about what are the important technologies to develop in humanitarian engineering. I mean, the list that's generated by this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to associate those capabilities with technologies that enable those capabilities. And we'll discuss that through. So we'll be back visiting the Nussbaum Glover list. Okay, so is there a formula for combining capabilities? Um, this is a Marsha Sen saying this, the one that came up with the formula for combining education, income, and health, right? The HDI. He's saying for capabilities, forget it. You can't do it. Okay. There is an inequality of capabilities um, that's relevant to social inequalities, but he says there's no formula for quantifying it. Um, it and he asked the question, is equality of capability sought? And I think the answer is really no. And one of the reasons is, is in John Rawls' terminology, we have different native endowments. We're different. We're all different. We have different capabilities, too. He doesn't say how to deal with conflicts between accumulation of capabilities by people, so-called aggregation, versus the spread of capabilities across many or all people, that is the distribution. Um, next, idea of sense. He says that the attainments of human functioning that we value are diverse. Like, he defines human functionings as Oh, as many things that we, he thinks of it as things that we're doing and you know, behaviors every day, how well nourished we are, how healthy we are, our, our uh, functioning of, of uh, studying, uh, many, many, many things, okay? So capabilities are the ability to achieve combinations of functionings, is, is his definition. It's not only achieve functionings, but opportunities and choices for functionings. In other words, you know, if I don't want to, have some functioning like I don't want to study or whatever and I don't value it and that's okay okay but it's my choice he's saying I'm supposed to have the freedom of choice to make that choice everybody's supposed to have that um, so he says that public reasoning can result in a better understanding of the role reach and significant of, of functionings and their combination and the choice and weighting of capabilities um, when he says weights, though, here, he's not talking about mathematics and weights and the way math uses those. He's just talking about your sort of emphasis on that capability, whether you emphasize education more, or health more, or income more, something like that. Um, the agreement on those weights may not be complete. There may be need for some range of weights or partial orderings. Okay, now, when I read the idea of justice, I, I, I had a little bit of a hard time in because of one thing. I wanted to hear a clear statement of how Sen felt about, about inequality and what we do about fixing inequalities, all right? 
And I read that book carefully, okay? This is like, I don't know, probably a 400 page book. And I collected all of his statements, the whole book as I was, as I was reading. And he has some statements, but he didn't put it all together. So I tried to put it together and I put it in my book, but consider the following. I mean, Rawls has the difference principle at the center of what he's doing, okay? Remember, the difference principle says inequality is fine so long as the inequality fixes the inequality. That's essentially what Rawls is saying. It helps the least advantage. If you help the least advantage, then they should come up and the inequality should decrease, right? Okay. Well, so I want to know if, if San agreed with Rawls' difference principle which he never explicitly says in the whole book, okay? But consider the following. He says, why, he starts talking about the two principles. Now remember, the difference principle comes in Rawls' second principle. The first principle was rights and freedoms, okay? So he comments, Sen does, why should we regard hunger, starvation, medical neglect to be invariably less important than a violation of any kind of personal liberty? So what he's saying here is he disagrees with Rawls. He's saying he doesn't, the two principles of Rawls are ordered, one first, then two. He's saying that's wrong because it shouldn't always be that the rights that we have as individuals would overshadow the importance of fixing inequalities in opportunity or with respect to public goods, as John Rawls was saying. So in a certain sense, this looks like Rawls is saying the difference principle is more important. But he never says it. Okay? Next, he says, why must any violation of liberty, significant as it is, invariably be judged to be more crucial for a person and for, or for a society than suffering from intense hunger, starvation, epidemics, and other calamities? He's repeated another point in the book, and yet he won't say he agrees with Rawls' difference principle. Okay. He never says anyone has, it really has to fix the inequality in a sense. In a sense, he's not saying that except in roundabout ways, okay, which is, is a little surprising. You understand, this man has a, a lot of experience, okay. So when he was a, a boy in India, he moved at one point to a location in India and lived amongst a famine and saw terrible, terrible suffering. I mean, this is, he's seen it all firsthand, okay? Um, he's not like an armchair professor. I mean, he's, he's he, well, maybe to some extent now, but he, he's got a lot of experience he's basing his comments on. Next, Sen is perhaps most passionate in the whole book. I say perhaps, but for me it definitely was. About doing something about helping people in the worst case. And he, he makes it very clear in the way he talks that the worst case is very poor people who are also disabled, physically or mentally. Now, if you've been in the developing world, I can tell you those are the cases that just make me like, oh, it's just, it's mind-blowing, okay? And uh, you really feel for people that are in these situations. Now, they're not given the kind of help you're going to get here, you know? There's not the wheelchair ramp, you know? There's not the wheelchair. You know, I mean, so he, he makes a pretty impassioned state, set of statements about this case. Um, next, he says that while reduction of capability and equality deserves our attention, but he also says, let's focus on increasing capabilities for all. So that's sort of my read on how he's dealing with uh, injustice. Is in some ways, he's got very, very strong statements. In other ways, I don't think he put it together in, the, in, in his book in an easy way. Okay, um, next, and I want, I want to discuss this for a little while here, uh, this slide. I particularly find in Marsha Sen's work um, resonates with me as an engineer, okay? Let me give you a little background. So Marsha Sen started out as a physicist. I mean, this guy does math, okay? I mean, if you can look at some of his books, it's like it's all math. So he's got a type of view and connection to engineering philosophically in a certain way, okay? Um, and so if you remember the definition, right, in the first page of the preface, the definition of technology, one simple definition is, is that technology is simply a tool to extend human 
capability. Okay? So, you're, you're in the Stone Age and somebody invents the hammer, a rock tied to a stick. Okay? That's a great tool. It extends your capability because you can pound in nails. No, there's no nails. You, because you can beat your neighbor to death. Okay, maybe. Or because you can pound a stake in the ground, because you can break another rock, whatever. You get the point. It extends your capability beyond just what I have in my own hands. Now, these computers are fantastic, right? Here we are today. Talk about extending human capability. It's unbelievable the extension of human capability this provides. But technology does many things in terms of extending human capability. Civil engineers, bridges, toilets, water systems, ag engineers, <coughs> fertilizer. Four billion people in the world are alive today because of fertilizer. Can you believe that? That's what's feeding four billion people on the face of the earth. That's a technology. Tractors, electrical engineers, well, I have a computer, cell phones, mechanical engineer, the car, it extends your capabilities, you can drive into work as long as the weather's not too bad. But every engineer, I, I, mean, I'm not, I don't mean to, chemical engineers, Nate, so help me out here. Aaron, how does the tool, what is, the technology that chemical engineering creates that extends human capability. It's food that can be processed essentially and sent to a bunch of different places. Food processing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Medicine. What other discipline did I forget? Architecture. Housing. Absolutely. It's a lot better to have to be in an apartment or a house today than it is with a big coat outside when it's what right now? I mean, or tonight it's going to be minus eight degrees tonight low. I mean, that's a technology. So it's all these things are extending human capability. I mean, you got to think of technology as a very, very broad term. But it, it is as broad from what I, everything I can tell as Sen's notion of capability. Therefore, I can't, it's, okay, there's a few cases in that list from, from Nussbaum and Glover that they list these capabilities that we may not have a technology for. We'll talk about those in a minute. But almost all of them we can help with as engineers. I mean, remember, engineering, engineers are inventors of technology. Modify it, use it off the shelf, create new technology. That's what, what it's about, using math and science. So we're using math and science and engineering methodology to extend human capability. So, um, wow, I mean, to me, that right, this uh, connecting Sen, who's talking about social justice, <coughs> to technology, to engineering, is what most of this class is about. I mean, that, that really is so, so basic to what we're trying to do. Um, for me, out of all the other systems of social justice, um, what do we do? Catholic, um, Hindu, um, Islamic, um, Rawls. We're going to do engineering ethics on Friday. This is, is, is so close to engineering, the way Sen is saying these things, okay? So you're trying to give people capabilities with technologies, and we'll talk again about the matching. Let me do an example that, that I, I mentioned a minute ago. This might seem like a funny one, but I want to I want to engage you in a discussion on the following. So Glover and uh, Nussbaum say say uh, to have pleasure and fun um, should be a basic human capability to be happy. Okay, <coughs> um, okay, that's a capability. Let's say. What's the technology that helps meet that capability? Yeah. Anything that reduces the amount of work. To give yourself leisure time. Good, very good. Reduce human toil. Yeah, and, and there's, wow, there's a lot of that. What else? Oh, come on. How do you have fun? Do you guys go and play cards with each other around the table? No, you don't play cards. Like, I try to get my kids to do that with me. And where do I call them in from? What are they doing? When they don't want to play cards with that. What do you think? Video games. Video games. They're on the Xbox. Okay. And I imagine there's a few Xbox players here. No. No? Guilty. 
Guilty, good man. I'm just kidding. I can't do any of that stuff. I'm, I'm, I never made it past Pong, okay? Um, so, so, but look, I mean, uh, so let me, right here, I, I, what I see my daughter, Juliana, doing, she's like this all the time. Uh, and she's having fun. She's on, what are you on, ladies? Pinterest. <laughs> okay? My daughter's like all over that. There's a lot of fun we have with technologies, right? I mean, technology extends our ability to have fun. This is, a, you know, my kids are like, you know, you know, it's it's sort of more fun and engaging to be on playing a, what Call of Duty than it is to you know play cards with that. Although I get them to play cards with me quite a bit actually, and they ask to play cards with me. But um, so here's the question: I think you get where I'm coming from now. You go to Guatemala. Is it humanitarian engineering to invent a game for the Mayan children? That's an electronic game on some device, and they play that game. Is that humanitarian engineering or not? You're just having them. It's not helping their health. It's not helping their education. Forget about that. You're not going to sneak in math equations. It is just simply driving a little car and having fun. <laughs> is that humanitarian engineering or not? Daniel's saying yes. Yeah, because it's using technology to improve their humanity, just their basic enjoyment of life. So. Okay. Anybody else? Valerie, you were saying, you were going, yeah, it is. I did. It gives them exposure to technology. It gives them creative and thinking. And yes. It is about technological capacity, exactly, because use matters. You know? Anybody else? Yes. Just be on the other side here. Uh, so isn't every game humanitarian engineering? I mean, you're improving the happiness of everybody around the world. You're making a video game. It, it, right. I mean, so, so is, um, is a deck of cards a humanitarian technology? Yeah. Um, is, uh, I, somebody help me with some of these, Mancala or uh, Aggravation or uh, a game from India, board game. What he said. <laughs> I mean, there's games all over the world. Are these humanitarian technologies? See, it, it, this. It, all right. So, do you see? There's some issues we're not discussing here yet, too. This is this is more complicated than first looks. So you go into the. We're going to be spending a lot of time in chapter four talking about the issue of how you assess, work with the community to assess their needs. Okay. So the question is, let's say you go to community and you're carrying around your, uh, your a phone or an iPad. You're messing around in the background playing hockey or some other game. You play with some of the, the some adult or parent or kid, whatever. They're having fun. And you're saying, what do, you, what do you need? They don't have water. They don't have clean water. They don't have sanitation. Okay? They don't have health care. And, and you ask them what they want and they look at you and say, I want that. I want what you have. I want, because that's fun. What? And, and let's say the whole community says, yeah, we want that. So what do you do? Anybody? What do you do? Give them what they want. It's, uh, I mean, I think it's kind of like a part of humanitarian engineering, I think, is providing something that is lacking. You know, if, if you provide a game for Americans, we have plenty to choose from. We have no shortage of entertainment at our disposal. So adding another game is not humanitarian. <coughs> but if you go to this village and they have no games, and you give them one game, you can view that as being humanitarian. You know, I, of course, we've got to be careful how we word things. We're not talking about here, in, in, in the philosophy we'll get to in chapter four is there's no giving. Is that we're going to work with them to create a game, you know, that, that they like and have fun with. I mean, it, it, that's an important distinction. But wouldn't it be a little hard for you to stomach when their children are, you know, getting respiratory diseases because of the smoke in the Guatemalan house or the, the contamination you saw Chris and Zach with their, you know, this water, and yet they want this. See, for me, 
I like the exa- I, mean, I, I don't consider an example to be a joke because it teaches this example is really extreme in some ways, but it teaches us something. It teaches us, I think, that you know, there's all kinds of capabilities, there's all kinds of needs, and it, it really isn't up to us to decide what they need. I mean, do you know what I need right now? Uh uh-uh. uh. I need chocolate ice cream with almonds right now. Okay, you don't know. What do you need, Katie? That too. Yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> Pecans would be okay, but I mean, you know, but look, I mean, we don't know what each other need. Let's get real. I mean, you know, someone could be um, mentally ill that you're talking to. What they need is medication, health care, whatever. Somebody could have, you know, other problems that aren't apparent to you when you're talking to them outside their home because there's no toilet inside their home. You may not know what their water situation is. You just can't know a lot of times. You have to respect what people say. I mean, people, people aren't stupid, you know? And that's one of the problems with this attitude of the rich towards the poor. You're stupid. No, they're not stupid. I mean, the other thing that we're going to come to, um, we're going to come to this issue two more times in class. One of them is when we talk about um, poor economics by Benergy and Duffalo um, and priorities. And uh, then we're gonna, we had a fantastic example from this class last year that I put in my book of a, a student on a humanitarian engineering trip where this, is, this related issue came up. And uh, Andrew Fenner, F-E-N-N-E-R, if you just search in the book, you'll find it. It's a cute little story, um, actually. Um, and uh, so, so this issue actually does come up, and I think it teaches a lesson. I, I'm not going to set up a trip to go to Guatemala to install games these days, but it makes you think about the issues is all I'm saying, okay? Um, and what's interesting, coming back to the slide, you know, they put that on the list of essential capabilities. In other words, if you can't have pleasure, you can't have fun, you can't have happiness, you can't live a good life. Well, that sounds right, doesn't it? So it is essential. But if you, if I dare you to pick one of the trips, okay, that are going, there's eight trips this year in humanitarian engineering out of the College of Engineering. And propose to them that you, um, you know, work on uh, video games for the people you're going to see. I think you're going to raise some eyebrows. Okay, okay. So just don't tell them I told you to say this. Just kidding. Um, next, you want to focus technology to enhance the most deprived capabilities. Some people would say. Okay, the most needed technologies, and this is really problematic because. You might look at something, as we were just saying it, and say, the worst problem is this. And yet the people may say something different. Okay? Um, one of the most important and difficult parts of humanitarian engineering is figuring out what to do. Just, you know, what are we going to do? And what are we going to do is not decided by the team from Ohio State. Okay? It's decided by the team from Ohio State and the group of people that you're working with, with strong respect given to what they're saying. And, you know, we're going to be talking about that when we talk about participatory development in, um, later in class, okay? Um, so, SEN's work in the end really does have um, a lot of relevance. Um, SEN seems to, in his 1972 book, um, I put a quote in the preface, if you remember. Um, it's fascinating. He, he, he clearly understood. He st- made a statement that said something like, um, because we understand the science of how to fix a problem in a country, that is really distant from actually getting it done on the ground with a technology in a country. And the thing in between those two is engineering. Okay. So I, I think in, in really many ways in reading Sen's writings, I, I, it resonates um, with me. Um, now, I, I'm saying all this, he, he, sometimes he's a little abstract and a little uh, philosophical, et cetera, but um, I think that of the two books, if you want to read one, um, Development is Freedom is, I think, um, the better book. And uh, Development is Freedom is, is shorter. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I would recommend that one if you, if you were to do something. It's, it's often covered in um, development studies classes and so forth. Okay, um, 
questions, comments? Okay, we're done.